free. And I think it's been, you know, really foundational in a lot of people's thinking. So um, he's doing a lot of great stuff, you know, now. And I also heard him on uh, doing an interview on Radio EcoShock, um, which was a really good and um, a plug in for my own interview, which happened a couple weeks ago. But anyway, um, uh, John, I will turn it to you, over to you. Thanks so much. And we're all eager to hear what you've got to say. Great. Thanks, Patrick. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you. You, you are all probably the most focused uh, group of, of diverse professionals, but working on the issue of, of uh, planning and adaptation uh, for sea level rise. So it's, uh, I'm, I'm really glad to have the opportunity, and I would certainly invite Lily to send me a list of who's on the call, particularly if somebody else joins, but so that I have a list of the names and the affiliations and perhaps uh, emails would be great. So to dig right in, and unfortunately, I do. Ha I have another conference call uh, at the end of this hour, so I'm going to drop off really promptly uh, in 51 minutes. But I want to try and push ahead to allow some time for questions, and then we can figure out other follow-ups. I, um, as Patrick said, I wrote my book High Tide on Main Street. Um, it came out in October 2012, second edition a year later. I have another book coming out next year, which I'll tell you about at the end of this. Uh, moving forward, it's called Moving to Higher Ground, and it's kind of the sequel. Let's just get into a, kind of the way I present the facts. Some of you have perhaps seen me talk or watched one of the YouTubes. Uh, probably the best YouTube is from the Royal Institution earlier this year in London. If you, if you want a longer version or to share with people, that's gotten over a quarter million views in the last uh, four months. Uh, by far the most watched uh, presentation of mine. Um, the, the one thing I would say up front is not only do I try and put things in very plain in English, and it's not, you all are probably capable of much more complex um, ways of looking at this, but I try and give information in a way that, you, that people can share with others regardless of their technical expertise. And it's my goal to make things, to do things without any jargon. I don't even use the word mitigation. It's far too technical. Um, of course, not really, but uh, it's just a point that I like to talk about slowing the warming or reducing the flooding. It, and I, I make that point because I think too many people in the climate field like jargon, and even the word mitigation means two totally different things. It means to slow the warming by reducing greenhouse gases, as you know, and it also means to reduce flood hazards, and it's not a common word. So I just, uh, that's an FYI up front. The biggest thing probably the different between me, somebody's got their mic on them, and it's being noisy. So unless you're asking me a question, please turn your, put your mute on. Uh, thanks. Um, the, uh, the biggest privilege I have besides having really just focused on sea level rise for the last 10 years and looking at all aspects of it um, is that because I don't operate within academia or you know, in, a, in a rigid scientific um, capacity, I'm able to interpret things at, uh, perhaps more broadly. And um, I think our concern needs to be more about what could happen with sea level rise. The IPCC, as I'm gonna get into, describes what they think will happen. And unfortunately, it's a huge gulf because of the uncertainties about Antarctica's melting, as most of you know. But that's just to give you a reason of why I'm able to say things you know, that we could have five or 10 feet of sea level rise this century, whereas the IPC says we could have up to uh, 92 centimeters, but they don't include Antarctica, basically. And so that's just to give you an overview framing for those that aren't familiar with the way I explain things. But I'm going to get through that now quickly as I can in the next uh, 40 slides or so. Some of them go pretty quick. They're just images. And then I'll certainly give you time for questions. Okay. Um, whoops. Oops. Oh, why is this not advancing? That's not good. Let's try that. Okay. You know, the first misunderstanding that the public has is thinking that icebergs melting at the sea level. And so it's worth uh, clarifying that. And I use a simple glass. Uh, all my explanations are really simple. A glass of water with ice cubes floating, you can draw a line and wait for the ice to melt and the level won't change. It's because ice is less dense than water, as most of you know. It's the ice on land the glaciers turning into ice, new icebergs, like adding ice cubes to a glass, uh, or the meltwater, or thermal expansion of seawater. I guess I should back up on that. So just so we're clear, and again, I'm sure that almost all of you are fully aware of the, of the physics and the simplicity, but when we explain the problem to others, they don't know that. 
90% of the people out there, roughly just by my casual survey, assume that melting icebergs are why sea levels rising. So it's important to start with a good fact base and educate them because uh, they really do have confusion. Um, okay. Uh, this is, if you do want to connect me with me on Twitter, it's at John England or really simple. That's my website. I'll give it to you at the end as well, but um, just for your ease. When we communicate things about rising sea level and climate change, there's a lot of different phrases as shown in this word cloud. You know, sustainability, resiliency, adaptation, climate change, global warming, greenhouse gas emissions. Um, words are useful when they're specific enough that we know what they mean. And unfortunately, with some of these words, there's confusion. People use sustainability to describe um, and resiliency to describe things that I would call adaptation. Uh, so I want to get into that. But I, and again, you'll each have your own nomenclature in your organizations, some of which you probably can't change, uh, depending upon governments versus uh, even some of the NGOs, because it's pretty well embedded. But just to, to suggest to you that we need to use terms that are accurate and definitive and distinctive, otherwise we're not communicating. So for example, climate change is commonly referred to today as a problem, which of course it is, but it's really three different problems I, I would submit. And uh, I break it into what I call sustainability, resiliency, and adaptation, three common words, but I define them a little bit more specifically than most. Sustainability is something that can be done without depreciating the resource. So uh, things like recycling is a, is a sustainability action, but has nothing to do with climate change effectively. Uh, contrary to some public opinion. The uh, reduction of greenhouse gases is certainly a sustainability issue. To go to renewable energy or green energy is great, and eventually that will slow warming, but um, not in the next 30 years, unfortunately. And so that gets us to resiliency, which is preparing for floods, like hurricane, storm surge, and all the other things we think of as being resiliency, really important. I define resiliency in effect as being able to endure an event and continued operations or recover after an event, like a hurricane, Superstorm Sandy, et cetera. And then adaptation is the third thing. And very few people want to get to adaptation. Of course, you're, you as a group are probably the best group to talk about adaptation. That's your focus. But most people, as you know, they think that if we do enough reduction of greenhouse gases or resiliency planning that we won't have to adapt because they don't want to. And of course, that's why what your um, small cohort of, of leader, leaders and professionals is um, really a group I love. I I'm, I'm really appreciate the opportunity to talk to because you are looking at that focus of, of adaptation and that's pretty unique. Most people don't want to go there. Um, I'm struggling with mine. Okay. So again, different ways to communicate for different audiences, but the simplicity is that we tend to think of climate change as the topic. That's the green circle. I break that into, you know, three circles. How do the, the, the black one is the energy issues, which everybody wants to focus on reducing greenhouse gases. The orange one is all the impacts of a warmer planet, uh, affecting weather, water, temperature, ecological impacts, disease, food supply, et cetera. And then sea level is an effect, of course, but it's really special because as sea level rises, it changes the shoreline and it changes real estate and investments and assets and infrastructure permanently, effectively permanently. So I break it out as, a, as the third subset of climate change. Also, just from a nomenclature and framing standpoint, I talk about five flood factors. Most people think of flooding as the problem. Uh, uh, flooding needs to be thought of as five problems. It's storms, it's heavier rainfall. Rainfall turns downhill or downstream into more runoff, can, can multiply rainfall by 10 or 20 times. Uh, as we know, so you have to look at topography. Then there's king tides, which are kind of a, a, a new problem of flooding. Uh, not that the tides are getting bigger or the moon's getting closer, but king tides are getting bigger because under all of that, sea level's rising and it's starting to rise exponentially as we predicted. So um, to think of storms, rain, runoff, tides, and sea level rise as five flood factors may be a, a construct or a, a tool that you can use because otherwise, if people say, well, let's, let's deal with the flooding, well, what's the flooding from? Is it predictable like tides? 
Is it, um, you know, predictable in terms of a few days like storms? Is it heavier rainfall, runoff, et cetera? So just a framing and nomenclature issue. Uh, again, obviously what storms are. We're seeing these extreme tides from San Francisco on the Embarcadero. That's the, there's no vertical land movement out there to speak of it. So the land's not subsiding or uplifting that the Embarcadero, which many of you have been to, has been at that same elevation for 140 years. It's flooding now in a way that it didn't used to. The change factor is sea level rise. Same thing on uh, just streets. This is, happens to be a street in Fort Lauderdale. Um, a friend took this picture of trucks on the right, boats in the background, and an awake sign on the street. The, they, uh, that That's used now about 20 or 30 days a year as the king tides get higher because sea level is getting higher. Um, storm drains that were designed to take excess rainfall, take it to some nearby waterway when it was designed 50 years ago, now bring salt water onto the streets. So one more kind of framing and nomenclature suggestion that you, I, I certainly invite you to use, steal, borrow, whatever, you can attribute me if you wish, but just uh, feel free to use it. I'd like to categorize five environmental categories. One is ecosystem, anything related to, to um, living organisms. So the biosphere, animals, forests, uh, humans, uh, diseases, all of those things is certainly an environmental category, the ecosystem. Then there's recycling, waste, uh, you know, conserv conservation materials. So that's the number two here in purple. Uh, we're all familiar with that, but it's quite different than the ecosystem, although there's impacts of plastics in the ocean, but they're rather distinct issues. And the third is the energy issues, which is of course front and center now, as we try and reduce greenhouse gases to slow the warming, to slow the melting, et cetera. Everybody's familiar with that, and they think of that as climate change, which is great. But then we separate out, as I just did a moment ago, in orange here, the climate change impacts of high heat, abnormal weather, wildfires, ocean acidification, melting ice, glacial retreat, et cetera. And then the most specific one of sea level rise because it will permanently change the shoreline and turn land into a worthless underwater uh, property. So again, um, you, you may add on other environmental categories. I try and keep things to three, four or five bullets to remember. I find that's all that people can easily remember. Sea level rise in the 20th century, I'm sure you all are familiar with this somewhat, that it has risen 18 to 20 centimeters or about eight to 10 inches. It's been a pretty steady line, although there is a slope to that line and it's beginning to curve upward as one would expect. It's not too easy to see the slope in this 170 year perspective, but if we look at that upper right, the red line of this, since we've had satellite data, since 1992 when Topex went up, was the first satellite that could get us really accurate altimetry on the ocean height. Um, I'm gonna blow that up now. So looking just from 1993, when we had that satellite data, we see a, a really important trend. I'm sure a few of you are aware of this, but probably not all. So since 1993 to 1997 or so, the, the, the slope of the line was about 1.5 millimeters a year. Um, that's uh, that's like a 60th of an inch. I mean, it's really small. Um, if we move forward to the next kind of segment of this of this satellite sea level data chart, it's at 3.2 millimeters a year. It's double. And then in the last period of time, since about 2011 to uh, 18, it's at five millimeters a year. It's almost double again. That doubling time or exponential growth is what really is the problem. And it's why we're gonna get fooled. And when we look at adaptation over the next decade or two, there's one level of problem inherent in that. But for things like infrastructure and long-term planning, zoning, building codes, we need to think beyond that. We need to think 30 years plus is my, my kind of a benchmark or sweet spot. And when you think through what a doubling time could do by as early as mid-century, we really need to think differently because just stepping back and looking at exponential growth, looking at the amount of ice that's melting on Greenland and Antarctica and the thermal physics of it, the IPCC and other things have are misleadingly low. And I hate to, to sound like I'm criticizing them. It's a great 
document. It's a wonderful effort. A lot of the scientists working on IPCC are, are friends and they do an amazing job, but their, their protocol has the um, understate uncertainty. And I, I'll get into that in a minute. You've perhaps seen some of my slides that, um, and I know you're videoing this and can share this, but so as we, most of us know, since the last ice age, sea level has risen about 390 feet, call it 400 feet, 120 meters. There's, besides that huge number, there's a couple of important points that again, I suspect most of you are fully aware of. Sea level didn't rise smoothly. There were three inflection points as shown by those blue arrows. If you were at any of those points in history, like 14,000 years ago, when sea level rose very swiftly, um, more than a foot a decade, you would not be able to see the future by looking at the past. And this underscores the problem where most people want to look to the last 30 years to try and foresee what the next 30 years is going to do. It doesn't work like that. I mean, it, it's smooth and linear to a degree in the very short term, but um, sea level will rise abruptly as the Antarctic, or as either the big ice sheets, Antarctic or Greenland in this case, um, go through collapse phases uh, of abrupt change. Most people aren't, don't think of it that way. And then the other interesting takeaway from this graph to me is always that sea level got to the present level about five or 6,000 years ago, which is effectively all of human history. I mean, if the, the uh, if you go back and even to, to Chinese or the Eastern European Turkish records and, and things where they, they have long history of thousands of years, it's still civilization goes back to five or 6,000 years. What you can think of it as the uh, old Testament days, if you wish, or the, the length of the, uh, uh, Chinese, Jewish, and Mayan calendars uh, starts about 5,000 years ago. But however you define it, it's hard to say that civilization predates six or 8,000 years. And the interesting thing is that sea level has been stable for that entire period of time, which is why we have a great deal of difficulty imagining sea level being different. And I like to get people to laugh at this point because it's kind of a depressing, scary thought and it is important to get people to laugh uh, when they're considering tough subjects. So uh, this slide from Ice Age Part 2, the meltdown is a great icebreaker, no pun intended, <clears throat> that uh, um, with the two miles of ice, roughly three kilometers, 10,000 feet behind uh, Manny, Diego, Sid and Scat, that uh, sea level rose 400 feet or 120 meters. That's certainly uh, understandable to anybody. Nobody doubts we've had ice ages. They probably don't know that the most recent ice age was 20,000 years ago. And so it becomes a point to begin to connect for them geologic history with uh, the kind of things people believe about climate change and ice age, which are at, at odds. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm, you, most of you probably associate this chart with me. It was put together with the help of Dr. James Hansen. For my, it's in my book in black and white, but um, many people think it's probably the best single image to pull together climate change. Again, I give Hansen certainly credit for the information. Um, that uh, and it, so there's four ice age cycles here. The, um, to just quickly talk you through it, ice age, the period of the, what we think of as the glacial periods are commonly called the ice ages. We're still in an ice age because there's ice at the poles, but the, so using the common use term of the ice ages, the ice age cycles uh, are roughly 95 to 125,000 years. So roughly 100,000 years, I should say. Um, <clears throat> within somewhere between 95 and 125,000 years. If you're not familiar with it, it's, it's the Milankovitch cycle. You can look it up on Wikipedia or it's in my book in a page. It's an orbital cycle. It's a, it's a, ice ages are basically super summer and winters, very similar to the reason we have summer and winter of the amount of heat we receive being 
dependent upon the distance from the sun um, and the cycle of, of uh, orbital movement. Um, temperature and sea level go together because over thousands of years, the ice sheets either get bigger or smaller and that changes sea level and, and uh, that will respond to global temperature. So that's why the red and blue lines go together, red being global average temperature and blue being sea level. The green line and red line have a little more complicated um, relationship. Historically, until human intervention during the, by burning fossil fuels, the ice age cycles, the up and down red line will affect the ocean temperature. And when the oceans are warmer, they release carbon dioxide. When they're colder, they absorb more carbon dioxide based upon a law of physics that the amount of gas in solution in a liquid is dependent upon the temperature. So that's why historically temperature drove the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. What's happened now is shown in the circle in the upper right, this is all, all of you know, is that CO2 has broken out of the normal boundary of 180 to 280 parts per million, the up and down amplitude of the green line, and is now at 410 basically, 40% higher. And because these three lines all move in close synchronization for different principles of physics, the problem is that as proven in 1859 by Sir John Tyndall, that CO2 traps heat. It's not, that's not really in dispute as it's a clear greenhouse gas. And as we put more CO2 in the air, we're warming the temperature that's gonna melt the ice and raise sea level. Okay. Um, so I use Florida just to illustrate, you know, and kind of surprise people who haven't thought about it much, the, the effects of... Sorry, I keep getting these calls. I don't know if you hear that or not. Anyway, um, you know, the iconic shape of Florida, everybody knows in the world, um, 20,000 years ago, when sea level was down 400 feet, Florida was twice the size. And 120,000 years ago, at the last warm spot in the Ice Age cycles, sea level was 25 feet higher, so Florida was half the size. Again, I, I really simplify things. That's, I think, the best way to communicate. Avoid all jargon, try and make it as untechnical as possible. The, uh, most people assume that the melting Arctic ice cap or polar ice cap, uh, which does threaten the polar bears, which is a, a you know, certainly a concern and a, and a problem, and we need to think about it logically, but um, just sticking with adaptation here for the moment for our species and our civilization, the, uh, the melting Arctic Ocean, most people think there's, it's like Antarctica, there's land up there, as you all know, there's not. It's just frozen ocean. It's been frozen for three million years and it goes goes from bright white to dark blue. It's like painting your white roofed house dark blue. You're going to absorb more heat. It's the uh, ice on land, the glaciers. You can see how they're darkening from different causes here. As the glaciers break off into new icebergs, that's like adding another ice cube to a glass of water. The problem for sea level rise is really in two places. 98% of the ice on land is in Antarctica and Greenland. Uh, the other 2% is in the Alps and Alaska and places like that. But from a proportionality standpoint, it's all in Antarctica and Greenland. Antarctica is melting much faster. These ice shelves, most of you probably are aware of this, but it's important to distinguish within Antarctica. The West Antarctica and East Antarctica have kind of different characteristics but then the ice shelves, which fill the bays, uh, um, they're floating on water. They're like icebergs. And so even though this giant ice shelf, and you can see off in the background, Antarctica in this image, the mountains of Antarctica, um, this is Pine Island Bay. That's the NASA image. So there's about 40 meters, 120 feet there of ice above the water on that ice shelf, but that means there's nine times under underneath, so almost a thousand feet of depth, but it's floating on the ocean. So as that ice shelf breaks off into icebergs, and that's more and more in the news, that has no direct effect on sea level, but as the ice shelf in the bay breaks up, glaciers from land can move to the ocean, and as that happens, sea level will, will rise, just like adding an iceberg. That's kind of a cross-section showing how the ice Glaciers are 
being cut away underneath. That happens because water is 800 times denser than air. So even though it's very cold water down there, almost at freezing, it actually has a lot more heat content than air is why it's eating away underneath. And that has great concern because at some point, the melting underneath the glacier will happen at a point or to a degree where the glacier clears the brown area, the, uh, the bedrock there, the continental shelf that's labeled here, and would allow the glacier that's up on land to slide into the sea. We don't know when that'll happen. And this is for the Pine Island Glacier, the Thwaites Glacier. Uh, we speak of the Pine Island Glaciers, the group of six. You're probably familiar with that. The Pine Island's the second biggest one in Antarctica that is on the West Antarctic ice sheet and ominously could cause a lot of sea level rise. The six Pine Island Glaciers hold about 10 feet, um, three and a half meters of sea level rise amongst the six of them. And the simple problem is we don't know when they will slide, slide into the sea. And that becomes the big adaptation challenge, I think, for uh, the coming century, for this century. Greenland is surprising, just to give you, again, some quick uh, facts and things you can use. But Greenland is uh, surprisingly big. It's about here, just shown in reference to the eastern United States. It is at 1,600 miles north-south and 1,000 east-west, so therefore pretty much the same size as the eastern United States. It's covered by a couple of miles of ice. 80% of the island, I should say, is uh, that's from one of our uh, fact-finding trips. Uh, we're going to do another one of these next August. I just did one last month. I will tell you about that in case any of you could uh, manage to come. They're expensive, but um, really amazing trips to get people's heads into this. And uh, not only people like yourselves, but some of your clients or leaders uh, would do well to come to Greenland with us for, for the week. Uh, that's a, just showing the meltwater channels. Um, this is a iceberg that one of my uh, group shot uh, last month, just five weeks ago, in off of Greenland. Uh, as an example of these trips, to give it some credibility, I guess this is a uh, obviously man on the left, but Senator Angus King from Maine on the in the middle there, and then Admiral Paul Zukunft, who was until recently the commandant of the U.S. Coast Guard. They did one of these trips with me in uh, 2016. If anyone's interested, the trip next year, actually the date now will be August 10th to 17th. We do this trip through our institute, which I'll mention at the end, the rising, it's been renamed the Rising Seas Institute. It is a non nonprofit, 501c3. It's $20,000 into the institute and we cover all the costs of airfare, boat charters, helicopters, meals, hotels, everything. So it's it's not inexpensive at all, but you know compared to to uh, expedition travel, and um, we're gonna actually announce the dates next week. You've heard it early, but uh, if you're interested, we already have a, a prominent person from the New York Times signed up and and paid in uh, to do the trip. Uh, well, um, it, it'll be an eye-opening trip for all. So sea level rise projections. Uh, there. Of course, different projections by different groups all over the world. This is done by the Southeast Florida Regional Climate Change Compact, the four counties from the Florida Keys up through Miami-Dade County, Fort Lauderdale-Broward, Palm Beach counties, the four southeastern counties. And I like it because it's, it's clean. It's something that can be shown uh, to people without much confusion. Um, and it quotes three different time frames, 2030, 2060, 2100, and then three different sor sources the IPCC, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers high, high projection and NOAA's high projection. And so it's a pretty useful way to, to show the span of ranges here. But the inches goes from six inches in the upper left to 81 inches in the lower right of that table, which begins to portray the difficulty if we're, if we're getting people to do urban planning or infrastructure design, uh, everything from utilities or refineries we need to start thinking differently. And unfortunately, the range of projections, because we don't know how quickly Greenland and Antarctica will melt, is the problem. And it's largely misunderstood. I'll show you the IPCC information in a moment. But to jump ahead, so that we definitely don't run out of time here, because I'm, I'm talking too long, um, that 
I've come up with a new vehicle, and you're welcome to quote this. It's going to be announced in London by the British uh, Institute of Mechanical Engineers on November 12th in a bit of a press conference. But I've gotten them to agree that instead of trying to say how high sea level rise, the, we should turn the question around. We should say, what would be a safe design height to reasonably protect structures and infrastructure and, and uh, things like the Thames barrier when they rebuild it to take account of the possibility of what sea level will rise realistically. And that's not the way the IPCC frames things, nor most other climate authorities. So at their suggestion, this has now become John Englander's nine box matrix. This is version one, it will be updated, but um, you're welcome to use it. Uh, you know, titling it that way, I guess. And so, but it's a pretty simple concept to say, looking out 30 years, 50 years, or 100 years, as you would for infrastructure. So that's different than the year 2100, which is 80 years from now, by the way. But if something has low risk, medium, or high risk, this, based on all the input I have, but the freedom to kind of give my opinion, uh, but working with that engineering society, it's called IMEC-E, the Institute of Mechanical Engineers, the UK group, 130,000 members that they've now adopted, or they will adopt this officially on November 12th, to say that if you've got a low sensitivity structure and you're looking at 30 years, plan for a foot, 30 centimeters. Actually, we do, we do theirs in, in metric, but I did this for uh, the American audience in, in uh, US units. But if you had a high sensitivity thing, like a nuclear power plant or a refinery or a, a hospital, a, a new command center or something, um, that, or a bridge and you were worried about vessels getting underneath it and you wanted to look out for a hundred year dura durable, durable life or lifespan for the asset, you should probably look at like 20 feet. So again, there's, no, there's nothing specific to any of these numbers, but it, it's in sharp contrast to the methodology of the IPCC. Again, I have great respect for them, but um, that's not how we should be designing infrastructure. And I'll show you that in a moment. And this is just turning that into um, some typical graph lines. Again, extremely simplistic. Um, takeaways, rising seas and shifting shorelines are unstoppable. Even if we went to zero emissions, even if we could, the world could go to 100% solar energy today, we're still gonna get rising seas because the oceans are warmer, that extra heat is going to melt ice on Greenland and Antarctica. There is no way of accurately predicting how those glaciers will slide into the sea. So we need to begin thinking differently. Every inch makes a difference in short-term flooding. We tend to be on the lookout for the big storm event, but, um, oh, wait a minute, I've got a little problem going on, but um, let's see how I'm gonna do it. Okay, sorry, um, my next call has a technical problem like yours last week. Um, that people get understandably confused because they're worried about the storm surge from a hurricane of eight feet that could show up next week. And if it happens at a king tide and, and so on, in a place where the land's subsiding, it'll be even worse because the sea will be higher. But what we don't think about is that even another half inch of sea level rise, it's that last inch that determines whether a structure floods. And so, unfortunately, psychologically, we tend to look for the big event that can happen suddenly and imminently, like a hurricane, being worried about that flood event. But sea level is like a drip filling the bucket. And as it keeps increasing and probably accelerating, um, okay, um, you know, it's just a way to, to point out to people that, that it's the last inch that determines whether a structure floods. It's impossible to predict sea level rise accurately. The projections are now up to eight feet if you use NOAA's, but that's, even they say that's not an upper limit. We're, we're all subject to this problem of knowing or being able to predict how will these giant glaciers on Greenland and Antarctica collapse, melt, slide into the sea, and there's no way to accurately do that. Um, vulnerable property values, number four here, will be discounted much sooner than most people expect. Not like next year, but it could be a lot sooner than people expect. Most people ask the question of me, how long do they have before their property floods? And I point out that's the wrong question. When their property goes underwater, of course it's worthless. But in the interim, 
if their property floods more frequently, even if their property floods two days a year, it's being heavily discounted in value. People don't want to buy property that floods regularly. So even occasional flooding will discount the value of real estate. But we're already seeing the case where even properties that don't flood, but where there's imminent flooding or people can see that the waters are getting higher and higher during king tides, that um, those values are already being discounted. So, and that could happen a lot sooner than most people think. I mean, I could see in the next five or 10 years that, in fact, it's already happening. There was a recent study that said that comparable properties are 7% discounted in value if they're vulnerable to, to future flooding. So that's an important point. Um, what do I tell people they can do? They can educate themselves and family, everybody from friends, family, neighbors, their investment advisors, their elected officials. The simplest thing to advocate is revise building codes. I recommend they evaluate assets, probably using some of people on this call as, as kind of experts or authorities or to recommend companies that would do that. But you should look at assets based on vulnerability, somebody's age, their dollar, dollars at risk, percentage of, you know, if, if their house is uh, their biggest asset, they should pay a lot of attention to it. If they're elderly and have a lot of wealth, um, it they can probably enjoy that, you know, that, that, home site, wherever it is for the next 10 years and be fine. Sea level is not going to change that much. Or look at modifying the asset, raising it, or maybe selling and moving, you know, or to, again, depending upon their personal situation, enjoying it. I, it, I think it's important uh, to tell people to plan intelligently, but also not to panic. Sea level rise is not going to get bad next year. It's just going to get incrementally worse. Ultimately, the solution, I, I say plan for the first three feet of sea rise as soon as possible as a simple guideline. We don't know when it'll happen, but if you talk about it as plan for the first three feet, and you can quote me if you want as a, a source or make, make it your own quote, um, but it's probably easier if you quote me, then uh, and ultimately we need to elevate, retreat, or, or invest in the future with some uh, you know, better assets. There's some better new models. This is a company called Jupiter Intelligence. I'm an advisor to them, but the ne it's the next generation in terms of res accuracy of um, detail of time and um, uh, square meters. There are some neat new designs. This is from uh, Hoffen City outside of Hamburg, Germany. But this, these are not renderings. These are real photos. And the city floods often because the river backs up from the North Sea, the Elbe River. But uh, just gives you some ideas. If we get creative and get realistic about adapting, we will have some neat designs. Of course, floating cities, but that's not going to solve the problem. Miami's 4 million residents, nor Calcutta's, whatever it is, 15 million residents are not going to all go on floating structures. But we've got to be positive. We've got to rise with the tide, which means adaptation. Um, my next book will be out next year. If you send me an email to slides at johnenglander.net. I'll give you a small set of my graphic slides and you'll also be notified of my book coming out and I'll also give you the first chapter in about a month. Uh, and it just goes beyond the first book and it really tries to get people psychologically into what you all do, which is thinking about adaptation, not just about sea level. I mean, I start with that, I give an update on what I think is happening, but then really trying to talk about all of our mental blocks and all the reasons we're, we were like frozen like a deer in the headlights. So I think with that, I will, um, well, I did say I'd tell you something about the IPCC. So just I'll give you a second to jot down those contacts. My, I guess you already have them actually. Um, let me just zip ahead here to the IPCC. If you're not familiar with it, this is table 13.5 from, this is IPCC AR5. If you take all those numbers that you can't read on that slide, and put them in a simple graph. Those are the four scenarios for, for uh, sea level rise out of that table 13.5. It surprises people to see that, that when you look at the components, as I've grouped them here in this, in this graph of their numbers, that Antarctica is the light blue at the top, and it's two inches for the first three scenarios and only one inch for the last scenario for the worst case of warming. That's crazy. Uh, th nobody believes that in the worst scenario, RCP 8.5, that will have less contribution from Antarctica to sea level rise than we would in the other three scenarios. And the fact whether it's one or two inches is ridiculous. We're going to have probably feet 
of contribution. It's just that they can't quantify it by their own methodology. Their protocol for information in the IPCC requires that it be in peer-reviewed literature, it be quantifiable, it be at least one, two, or three sigma uh, confidence on the, the specifics that something will happen by the year 2100, not 2101. And so when to, to pass all of those tests, peer-reviewed literature, quantifiable certainty, et cetera, um, they wind up leaving out anything that's uncertain. And we don't know how much of Antarctica will fall into the sea in the next 81 years. So basically they asterisk it if you really follow what they're doing. And again, I, I don't, I hope this doesn't come off as criticizing them. I think it's an amazing process. Most of them volunteer their time, but their protocol or methodology causes them to understate sea level rise. And this is the proof of that. This is graph, my graph of their numbers. So I think at that point, I'm going to uh, let you unmute or send text questions. We've only got 10 minutes, unfortunately. I'm sorry. I, so I don't know, Lily, do you want to moderate or field questions? Sure. I think uh, with the size group that we have, people could just go ahead and um, ask questions out as they have them. Uh, so just go ahead and unmute yourself and ask a question if you want. But then um, I will definitely moderate any questions you want to send through the chat. If that works. Great. Come on. No questions, comments? Well, uh, John, I'll, I'll just have one. Um, so I really appreciate your presentation, um, especially one thing I really liked was that um, it was a really simple chart um, to use for just planning, I think in general, in terms of just you know estimates for, for, for land use planners. I think that was really good. I, I'm kind of curious to know, um, have you gotten, what level of interest have you gotten, say, you know, from, the um, say planning agencies and you know coastal communities and such um, uh, about that. Well, I mean, do you do you see that there's um, that do you see any communities that are starting to do this that are starting to just you know say okay let's just plan on the safe side for a certain level of you know probably potentially 15 20 feet of sea level rise. I'm just kind of curious to see what from your perch what is the awareness that you're seeing on the term on the part of like local planning which in a lot of ways is where the rubber hits the road on so many so much of this. So um, sure first of all that chart is brand new you're probably the first group that's ever seen that chart um, so, so I can't so there's no response to that but having talked to groups like this engineering society in, in Britain for the last uh, two or three years we've been working on this project which will be released in three weeks uh, published guidelines which will include those numbers by the way okay uh, it'll kind of move that forward but generally uh, nobody's looking at 20 feet Okay, that's just to say that if you really do want to look at 100 years to the year 2120 and you want to be very conservative and if you have an ultra, you know, critical case, as I, as I described, you really should think big. The best I can come up with, though, is I was in Singapore a few weeks ago and, and Singapore does do very good long-term planning. In fact, they're known, for, they've, they've really done a wonderful job of that in their 50-year history. And Amazingly, they're planning on four meters of sea level rise for coastal defenses. In fact, their new airport terminal, they're planning, it has to, it's gonna be five meters above sea level, 16 feet. So they are the best example in terms of forward, forward thinking. But even in the UK, they're starting to have a dialogue about this. And I've been part of it. Um, they've been saying up to a meter this century, they now realize that's too low. And so the question is what, where to go with that and the fact that the Institute of Mechanical Engineers is going to adopt that that table of mine and and release it next month as guidance for their 130,000 members is a big step forward. Anybody else? Thank you. Sure. Hi, John, Jeff Peterson. Hi, Jeff. Uh, great presentation. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, I also thought that the uh, the nine box uh, matrix was really interesting. Um, and I wondered if you thought about whether it's possible to uh, adapt that to uh, US 
sea level rise conditions or areas. It's based on global, I, I think I saw. So it's a global average to mean that, that you know, if, if New Orleans is subsiding or Norfolk subsiding or Alaska is uplifting, you know, you, presumably you have to do some adjustment is what that's about. Right. So I, I think it might help uh, U.S. communities to, to sort of adapt that a little more quickly if, if there were a way to uh, simply regionalize it a little bit, either just for the East Coast or, or maybe just I, I, some I, of those areas that would give people a little more of a, a handle on not just the global average, but the, the problem they're facing in their region. Yeah, you'll see they're very rough numbers. I mean, they're really rounded off to, to be the nearest foot and purposefully because we don't know it down to fractions of an inch or even inches. But I will probably try and do that, Jeff, but I certainly would welcome anybody to take that and say, based on John Englander's nine box matrix, here's what we think it should be for the Gulf of Mexico, you know, or, some, or Alaska, something like that. That would be fine with me, so. But I'll work on that too. <laughs> Hi, John. This is Kelly Main. Hi, Kelly. Hi. Um, thank you for your presentation. In the beginning, you talked about, of course, the broader category um, of climate change and the five major environmental categories within that. I'm right. wondering, because you write mostly about um, sea level rise, when working with communities that are facing you know, a variety of different climate-related challenges in any one of the categories, do you try to make an argument that says, well, everyone should be really concerned about sea level rise, even if you live in the Midwest? And if so, what is the argument that you made for that? Um, sure. And otherwise, do you have other resources and information about how to describe other challenges to communities in the categories that you've represented in terms of um, how local people might take action on their own communities? So, okay, and I'm gonna try and shorten questions here just because we've got literally five minutes and just try and give anybody else. So to answer your two, what I understood to be the two questions, um, for people who don't live near the shoreline, the way I connect with them is twofold. One is surprisingly, most people today travel, of course, and even if somebody is a farmer in Iowa, about as far from the, you know, the ocean as you can get in the United States, they go to Florida in the wintertime for vacation. They may have a timeshare. They may have their mother-in-law who lives there, okay? So we tend to, tend to forget we're a global, you know, we're a traveling society. People, people have a connection. They go to the Bahamas on a scuba diving vacation every year or Bonaire or someplace like that. So the first thing is you'd be surprised even when people live inland, they may have a, an emotional or even property connection to the, coast, to the coastal area. As far as how do I explain those other broader environmental or categories, I, well, you've seen how I do it. I, I will often frame a talk by saying there are five environmental categories to make sure that people don't think that recycling or getting plastics out of the ocean, which are both very good programs, don't, won't stop sea level rise. And I do that to make a distinction. I stay focused on sea level in my message for the obvious reason that it's not just to brand myself, but it's to become why we're here talking today, you know, the expert, lots of people are talking about greenhouse gas reduction. Lots of people are talking about getting plastics out of the ocean. Uh, lots of people are planning for storm resiliency for, you know, for a storm that can hit New York three weeks from now. So I've tried to identify myself as somebody who can do this global look at sea level, but framing it in the context so it makes sense against all those other, both places and issues. Any other questions? Great. Thank Thank you, John. That that's a that was a great answer, and um, thank you all. I know I'm mindful of your time and having to jump off, and um, everyone else is, as we have about a little under three minutes. So, um, so yeah, again, thanks so much. Um, there's one announcement that I wanted to make, um, and it will. Um, uh, one of our members, two uh, members of our leadership, Ira Feldman, has right now a residency at the University of Water.